So we've talked about when it comes to quality, we've gotten deep into the water perspective, talking about RL water and getting carbonated waters in glass. But how do you think about quality when it comes to food? There are a lot of different options now with non-GMO, organic, uh, grass-fed meats. How much of a priority are those for you when it comes to feeding you and your family? Not much of a priority. I, I think they do matter to some degree. And it, typically when you really tease down into the research, you find that that uh, so we'll, we'll use grass-finished meat, for example. It, it typically turns out to be somewhere between 1% and 5% higher in omega-3 fatty acids and maybe some vitamins and minerals, it's not a huge difference. And so if you can afford grass-fed, grass-finished, panda-massaged meat, then I think you should you should buy that because that's going to also stimulate the economy to produce more of that because we all vote with our dollars every day and many of us are voting with the wrong, voting for the wrong things, aren't we? Uh, and so, uh, yes, if you can afford organic, non-GMO, grass-finished everything, then definitely spend the money. But uh, some of us just can't afford that. And that's that's why I have a YouTube video called Cheap Carnivore. If, if literally all you can afford is bologna and hot dogs and spam, you can improve your health with those. Now, you may not be able to completely optimize your health, but you're going to it's going to be a great improvement over eating the other highly processed carbohydrate inflammatory crap that you were eating before. Uh, and people need to understand that because, you know, the economy is not great right now. And, and many of us think it may get worse. And so m being able to afford food is a big deal. Uh, and we can get off into all, all kinds of sociopolitical uh, whirlpools here. If you, if you want to, I'm happy to do that. But over the last 20 or 30 years, food has been cheaper in modern society than it's ever been ever in the history of humanity. Food food procurement used to be life and death, right? And then it was like, oh, it, it, it's 50% of your income to feed your family. And then it was for, for many, many centuries, it was 30% of your income roughly. That's what you spent on food every day, every week, every month. It was 30% of what you produced. You had to use that to either eat it or to, to procure your food. And for the last few decades, it's been five or 10% of your income for many people. And that that's, uh, that's very spoiling. That'll spoil you. And so all of a sudden when eggs and meat start to float back to what their proper price should be, for many people, that feels like price gouging. But they don't understand two things. First of all, you weigh real food by the pound. And you weigh highly processed food by the ounce or by the serving. That's the first thing. And so when you take when you take this box of Cheerios, that's 18 ounces, right? If you it's like, oh, that's a lot of food. Look at that big box. Well, if you took this and crushed it down and got rid of all the puffed air, it's maybe a cup and a half of actual food and and, and nutrient void food at the same time. Does that make sense? You don't weigh this by the pound. If they sold this by the pound, nobody would buy it because it's about $27 a pound. That's so interesting. If, right? And so many things are like that. The protein bars. This market is huge right now. And people think, oh, I need a protein bar, which is usually a carbohydrate bar if you look at the nutrition panel. But if you for some of these, like the Cliff Bar and like the uh, Quest Bar, they're, they're $25, $30 a pound if you, if you calculate the price that way instead of just calculating by the bar. But whereas eggs, if you if you if you calculate how much does a pound of eggs cost, it's like three or four bucks. It's super cheap. If you look at, at beef, it's so much per pound. And it's it may not it may be like shit, it's you know, sixteen dollars a pound, but it's still way cheaper than a cliff bar is per pound. It's way cheaper. And so even though the prices of real food have been going up, they're still much cheaper if you calculate them by the pound and then also calculate by nutrient density. This is so nutrient void, they have to fortify it, which means adding um, factory-made vitamins and minerals back to it. Well, that should tell you something right off the bat. You've never seen a fortified egg. You've never seen a fortified uh, pound of ground beef. You've never seen a fortified pack of bacon. You don't have to fortify those things because they're rich in vitamin minerals by definition. And so I, I think that people worry about the price of food, and you should, but at the same time, you have to understand 
the word food has a definition. Food means it's full of nutrition and it doesn't cause inflammation and it causes your muscles and bones to get stronger and it causes you to have good mental health. That's the definition of food. Food should be by definition good for you. So then you're like, well, is this really food or not? I would opine that this is not food. Or you could say it's a starvation food. I think that's another great way to look at this. If you're starving to death, eat all the Cheerios, eat all the grains, eat all the sugar. It'll, it, they will keep you from starving to death. But if your goal is optimal health, if it's ultimate ultimate health, this is not this is not the food you want to be eating. You want to be eating nutrient dense, ancestrally appropriate, uninflammatory food that has all the vitamins and minerals in there. That's real food, and that's going to cost you a certain percentage of your your daily or monthly income. Sorry, but yeah, food food is going to uh, your percentage of your your income that you spend on food is probably going to go up over the next few years. And then finally, one of the reasons I love a proper human diet so much, the concept and the principles is because it spurs local farmers and local ranchers because they're I'm a, I'm a, a country boy. I'm a redneck. And where I come from, there's always a risk that if you mislead someone, they will come and have a talk with you. Okay, that's a euphemism. That means they will come and they'll get you by your shirt collar and they'll say, hey, dude, you lied to me. And so this local farming and this local ranching, you actually know the guy that raised your beef or that raised your sheep. You actually know the name of the person which I, lo- I love that relationship. And I think I want to encourage that every time I can. But it also, the implicit assumption that is, if you mislead me, I know where you live. I'll come and find you. Where you know, who, who, Anybody know who the, the board of directors is for General Mills or Kellogg's? You don't know them. You can't get your hands on them. If they screw you out of your health, what's your recourse? You can maybe find an attorney and sue them. They'll have 18 corporate lawyers show up and have the case dismissed. But if you bought your beef from a local rancher, you know that guy. You can either go to him in person and thank him or her, give them a hug, send them a Christmas card. Or if they mislead you and make you sick, you know they're right down the road. And so I love that the principles of a proper human diet are spurring local farmers and local ranchers. People are starting to look. I wonder if anybody raises pastured eggs around me. I wonder if, if there's a, a local pig farmer where I can say, hey, I just want my pig to eat grass and acorns and grub worms. I don't want you to give them any grain. You start to look for that stuff and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'm happy to pay a, a little bit of a premium because it's real food. It's nutrient dense. It mimics the food that my ancestors have been eating for millions of years. So there's a lot tied up in this proper human diet movement that I think is very, very important that not only is going to strengthen people's bodies and minds, but it's going to start to strengthen local economies and spur production of actual real food. And so, but currently we're, we're, you know, if you live in an urban center, you're going to buy food from the grocery. You got no choice, right? You can't take a day off work and go out in the country and find a guy who's going to raise you a pig and some broccoli. You got to buy it. And so I think do the best you can. And that's another principle of a proper human diet is all you can do is all you can do, Jesse. Right. There are forever chemicals in our in our atmosphere, in our groundwater. Now, there's glyphosate. You you want a good uh, source of glyphosate? There you go. But there's glyphosate in everything now. There's nothing you can do about that. But the one thing you don't want to do is give up, because I think there's a huge space for you to in, improve your metabolic health and your mental health by eating a proper human diet. Can you reach perfection? Probably not because the corporations have poisoned the, the environment so much, but you can do drastically better than you're currently doing by choosing better options every time you put food in your face. As you're talking there, it gets me thinking about the two different aspects that come with buying better food. Part of it is the fact that you're going to get possibly some more nutrition within that food. And of course, if you're having something that's not processed like beef versus Cheerios, you're getting a lot more nutrition. But I'm talking about comparing like conventional beef to grass-fed beef. The other aspect is what you're not getting. So you're not getting, you know, certain 
say the beef has been fed grain that's moldy if you're getting conventional beef or there's glyphosate on that grain and then that accumulates in the tissue that you're consuming. So you have to look at it from what am I getting by spending more and what am I not getting? And that's a great point. And so let's talk about the the, the cow example. Uh, cows also, they have three filters that they run all their food through. First is the multi-chamber stomach because they're ruminants, Right. And this filters out tons of toxins. And that's why you can feed a cow an improper diet and they still don't die. And they wind up producing some of the the best human food on the planet. But they also have a liver, which detoxifies the hell out of their diet. They also have kidneys, which helps the liver detoxify this stuff. And so when you've run this inflammatory, slow poison food like grains through cows, They've, they've got three filters to filter out the, the inflammatory toxins and just the flat out toxins, the, the mold spores, all of this stuff. And so when you eat that, that pack of fatty meat, that cow's already done a lot of the filtering for you, right? Even the, the most poorly fed beef is still very, very healthy for the average human to consume. Very, very healthy. M- much healthier than any processed food that you can buy in the unrefrigerated section. So basically anything in a, in a plastic bag or a cardboard box, the cheapest beef you can buy at your supermarket is way better for you, not only with regards to the nutrition profile, which you touched on, but also that cow's already applied three filters to the food that it was fed to so that it's left with, with much, much healthier protein and fat that it, then you can consume. Right. So I, I, I love to uh, and, and, and let me just be very clear. I'm 100 percent opposed to the deplorable confinement feeding operations and feeding cows improper food. 100 percent opposed to that. But our, our alternative is, Jesse, what are we going to do about that right now? What do we do about that today? Well, you start looking for a local rancher and a local farmer. You start buying local pastured eggs. Because now you're voting with your dollars to support that instead of voting with your dollars to support the four big uh, meat processors in the United States. It's only four. People don't realize that. There's only, and, and they're probably going to, there's going to be a consolidation. Then there'll be only three. These guys care about profits and turning a profit for their shareholders and, and being in compliance with their board of directors. They don't give a damn about your health. The one thing they don't want to do is kill you quickly. Because if they kill you quickly, then that's a lawsuit that they'll probably lose. But if, if they cause inflammation and kill you slowly over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, they don't care about that because nobody's going to file a lawsuit about that. And so I am 100% for animals being treated properly, properly raised, properly fed. But if we just said that's it, um, we actually have an, an example of this in a, a foreign country that a, a few years ago said, that's it, only organic vegetables. We're not using any pesticide anymore. And I won't name the name of the country, but that that, that would, became law in this kind of dictatorial run country. Now they, they have mass starvation. They have, they're, they're literally dependent on handouts from other countries to keep their entire population from starving to death. And that's what would happen to any country that too quickly implemented this. And so I'm 100% opposed to that, but currently we're stuck with that because of the mistakes made by our elders and our predecessors. We're now stuck in that model until we can stimulate the growth of regenerative ranching and regenerative farming and get that scaled up to the point where we can all eat that. There's no, there's no way around this right now. And so for the poorest among us, you're going to be stuck with the cheap meat at the supermarket, which is not perfect, but it's way the hell better than what you were eating before. And then when if for people who are of means, they can buy pastured eggs and pastured pork and pastured grass-finished beef. Do that because you're actually going to stimulate that economy and eventually that'll lead to price decreases where other people can afford it as well. So coming back to this continuum of the proper human diet, it sounds like the entry point is getting your carbs down to 100 grams a day, gross. And then on the other end of that diet is the carnivore diet. For somebody who hasn't been counting carbs and conscious of how many carbs they're eating on a regular basis, just to get a ballpark idea comparison, what would you say the average American is consuming in amount in grams of carbohydrates versus that 100 grams? 
The average U.S. adult is consuming somewhere between 200 and 400 total grams of carbohydrates each and every day. And for many of them, a very high percentage of their carbohydrate intake is highly processed carbohydrates, which are basically made of three ingredients, sugar, some grain that's been ground up and highly processed, and vegetable oil. For many Americans especially, that is over 50% of their daily diet. Now, it may come in the form of a bagel for breakfast, right? A, a pizza crust, the pizza slice for lunch, and then some kind of bread, even if it's whole grain bread. But if you actually crunch the numbers, over half of their diet is coming from sugars, grains, and vegetable seed oils. And so that that's why my when I first started doing this social media thing, what, five years ago, my first three steps to adopting a proper human diet is get rid of all sugar from your diet. Definitely added sugar, but also eventually natural sugar as well. Number two, get rid of all the grains, all of them. They are starvation foods. They're not optimization foods. And then step three, get rid of all of the vegetable seed oils. And so there, there are three nut or uh, fruit oils, avocado, olive, coconut, which don't seem to be as inflammatory. They don't seem to be as bad. But many people, I'm one of these people, I, all my fat comes from animal sources. I don't, I don't consume any plant fat whatsoever anymore. It's all butter, beef tallow, uh, baked lard, sheep's, sheep's tallow, uh, chicken fat. That, that's 100% of my fat intake. And again, does that mimic the fat intake of our ancestors for the last three and a half million years? Yeah, that's where they got 100% of their fat. And don't don't come at me with olives and avocados because fifteen thousand years ago these those were pity and tiny. They they consumed them sure if they found them, but they were not what we consider a modern avocado, a modern olive. They didn't exist, and nobody was grinding up grains and trying to express oil from from grass seeds or from seeds fifteen thousand years ago. And so you say, well, why this arbitrary fifteen thousand year cutoff? Well, that's that's well before the agricultural revolution. And so if you just say, okay, what's the percentage of time for humans on this planet or our ancestors from 15,000 years ago back to three and a half million years ago? That's 99.99% of our time on this planet. So for 99.9% of our time on this planet, we never ate sugar, ever, unless we found some ripe berries. We never ate grains, ever, unless we were literally starving. And we didn't even have access to vegetable seed oils because you have to have a factory to process those. We never ate those. And so uh, again, people might call that an appeal to nature, but what I, what I call it is being honest and true to our, our DNA. That's, that's what we are as a species. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. I know that you've tried. I know that you've, you've really put in the effort, but you were given the wrong information. If you want good health and, until being very, very, very old, you need to eat this way.